Hi, I'm Vinuta Malia. Uh, I'm delighted to be the moderator of this evening's session of Talking Red Books. Today, we are talking about this book, Knowledge as Commons Towards Inclusive Science and Technology. It's not often that you hear of the word inclusive in relation to science and technology. And so this is a very uh, interesting evening for us to talk about these issues that bring science and technology together and look at it from the social relations and political economy of science and technology. I'd like to begin by introducing Prabir, the author of the book, Prabir Purkayasta. He's an engineer and a science activist in the power, telecom, and software sectors. He's a founding member of the Delhi Science Forum. He's co-author, along with Vijay Prashad, of Enron Blowout, Corporate Capitalism, and Theft of the Global Commons. And along with Nainan Koshi and P.K. Bhadrakumar of Uncle Sam's Nuclear Cabin, he's co-editor with Indranil Richa Chintar of Political Journeys in Health, Essays by and for Amit Sen Gupta. He's the editor of newsclick.in. Welcome, Proveed. I'd also like to introduce our panelists today who will be speaking about the book. We have with us Professor Ram Ramaswamy who was at the School of Physical Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University from 1986 to 2018. From 2001 to 2018, he also held a concurrent position in the School of Computational and Integrative Sciences at JNU. From mid-2011 to early 2015, he was Vice Chancellor of the University of Hyderabad, also known as Hyderabad Central University. He retired from JNU at the end of October 2018 and is currently a visiting professor in the Department of Chemistry at IIT Delhi. We also have with us Professor Fred Magdoff. He is an emeritus professor of plant and so soil science at the University of Vermont. He's an activist and a Marxist analyst. His areas of interest include agriculture and food, environment, and the US economy. He's the author and editor of numerous books, including Creating an Ecological Society with Chris Williams and What Every Environmentalist Needs to Know About Capitalism with John Bellamy Foster, both published by Monthly Review Press. Then we have Dr. Satyajit Rudd. He's an eminent immunologist who is currently Professor Emeritus at Indian Institute of Science Education Research in Pune. He trained as a physician and a pathologist and has worked on mechanisms involved in the development and functioning of the human system. He was a member of the faculty at the National Institute of Immunology in New Delhi before his retirement. His current research is focused on the generation and activation of TB and antigen-presenting cells of myeloid lineage. So we, I'd like to begin by inviting uh, Dr. Rat to talk about the relationship between science and technology and some of the themes that this book covers. Prabhi points out that we're talking about artifacts as the focus of the idea of technology. And it struck me, reading through Prabhi's um, extended disquisitions on what artifacts mean and how they shape the directions of technology development and implementation, that uh, in the word itself, very semantically, there is art and there is fact. And it's almost as though we are talking about art made fact. And an artifact is made to perform to order in a very predictive and predictable sense. You want the success of a technological artifact is that it reliably does what is expected of it when it is expected of it. And that's a remarkably interesting way for me to think about technology. It provides me with a remarkably curious insight on the processes of science itself that probably doesn't comment on and yet gives me this to think about. And that is the following. Prabhu talks about um, his unhappiness, which I share, that technology is referred to as applied science. Um, and he points out a little gladiatorially that 
uh, one can easily think about science as applied technology, which is perfectly correct. But here is an extension of that that he and his book have gotten me to think about. And that is that in order to achieve the predictability of artifact performance that I just referred to, an artifact will do what is expected of it when it is expected of it. In order to achieve that, Prabir points out at various points in the book that artifacts tend to be sets of interlocking components that function reliably with each other. Here is a fundamental distinction that I think we need to make between empirical knowledge, which is simply observing facts, putting them in a correlative chain and inferring causality from correlation. Um, you know, post hoc ergo propter hoc. If it if one thing happens after another, then the first thing causes the second. By and large, this is this is a major fallacy. Quite frequently, that scientists uh, stumble upon pretty much every day. But here's the problem: when you go from empirical knowledge, which is what communities and traditional knowledge largely, not entirely, but largely consists of into rigorously conceptualized knowledge, effectively, what that rigorous conceptualization is doing is building a Gedanken artifact, a, a thought artifact um, of the Urkayastha kind, which has components that fit with each other, that steadily enhance the predictive power of the scientific concept. And in this very basic sense for me, uh, and this is a very personal beginning, Prabhu's book um, provided a, a very curious insight on how thinking about technology illuminates for me how to think about my own science. I'd like to now invite Professor uh, Madoff to, to speak from his experience about the paradigm shifts in technology and the impacts they've had on ecology and on access to, uh, to especially food. I was a, a graduate student in the 1960s. I was a professor at, uh, at, a university, at mostly the University of Vermont from the 1970s through the mid uh, early 2000s, 2007 is when I retired, but stayed active um, up until relatively recently uh, in, in soils and keeping up with the, the science and what was happening. And um, basically, professors viewed themselves at, at the colleges of agriculture as public employees. Uh, we were paid mostly by state, that is our individual states and national government or federal funds uh, and uh, we considered ourselves to be state employees. We kept regular hours when other people at the university, uh, you know, would come and go. Sometimes uh, we were expected to be there, you know, during during the regular working hours of the day, which happened to be eight eight to four thirty. Um, and so, uh, and what we developed or what we uh, wrote about, uh, we all considered to be open information. Uh, because uh, this was government monies that were supplying our salaries. We were, being, we were doing this on, on government time, shall we say. Uh, it was a university, but still. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the new varieties were developed, and they were out there. New varieties of crops were developed, and they were out there for anyone to use. Now, a lot of times, private seed companies would pick it up, and use it and reproduce the seed and sell it, and that was allowed, but it, but it couldn't be patented, and it couldn't be, it was not privatized in the sense of being able to exert exclusive ownership over it. Now, things changed uh, dramatically in the 1980s, and I wasn't aware of the name of the law, but Prabir talks about it in a number of cases. The, um, this is the uh, Buy Dole Act, of 1980, named for two senators in the United States Senate. And um, 
there must have been incredible lobbying from industry to, to make this happen and from universities. But basically, a law was passed that allowed universities and faculty who work for them or anyone who got private, excuse me, got public money from the national government to privatize the results of the research. So you could take your research that you did on government time with government money, you hired a technician, you bought equipment for a laboratory, whatever you, you did with those funds, and you could come up with some new invention and you could patent it and you could get the rights to it and the university could get partial rights to it as well. And so uh, this was really the beginning of the corporatization of the universities in the United States. And it's gone very far after that. And now uh, students are no longer called students many times. They're called customers, like you're a customer at a, um, you know, at a McDonald's or whatever the equivalent is in India, a fast food restaurant or someplace else. You're a customer at a university if you're, if you're a student nowadays. What happened was in this system, you developed a way of approaching agriculture as a reactive way where there's a problem that you see, maybe a weed or a pest or is low fertility. Okay, we have a way to solve it. Just buy my product, my herbicide or my insecticide or buy my fertilizer and we will solve your problems. And what was really needed and what is really needed is an ecological approach where you take a whole system approach and you try to prevent these problems from developing. So like preventive medicine, you try to prevent the problems by keeping a person healthy. Uh, doesn't mean they don't get problems, they don't get sick, but it means they have fewer problems and you're not dealing with each one singly, you're dealing with the human as a whole. And the same thing with agriculture, dealing with the agro ecosystem as a whole, rather than little tiny parts of that ecosystem and then providing products to deal with the problems that develop in that those little parts, you deal with a whole system and you eventually have a healthier system, a healthier soil, healthier plants, fewer pest problems, etc. There's not money to be made in this by capital. And so they're not particularly interested in funding this type of research. However, it sometimes does get funded and that's something we can talk about. But open science is something which is on the table now. Uh, I'm in correspondence with people in Venezuela, and they are um, trying to institute a system for open science at the time. So this uh, this book of uh, Prabir's is, is quite timely. I want to extend that idea that you're ending with and ask Professor Ramaswamy to comment about how uh, funding has worked in in the science and technology sector in India and whether that has shaped particular ways in which uh, we've approached these two fields. Before I turn to that though, let me uh, <clears throat> congratulate Prabir on this book um, because, uh, I mean, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, for one thing, uh, Prabir has managed to keep a, a train of thought uh, more or less intact over a almost 50 year period. The earliest essay in this book, which is adapted, uh, is from 1978. Um, and uh, the most recent one is just from a year or two ago. So there has been a consistency in Prabir's thinking that you can see the development. Uh, it makes the book uh, very, you know, very interesting to read. One major idea that uh, Prabir has explored, of course, is in the title itself, knowledge itself as a common good. Uh, and this is an idea that has a lot of currency in different ways. Um, it, first of all, it's important that we not support monopolies, uh, but also uh, a very simple enunciation of, uh, of, of everybody's right to access to knowledge that is produced with everybody's money. Uh, namely, all publicly funded science should be made publicly available to as many people as possible. Um, this is something which is loosely called the access principle and uh, I mean, it's been written about by most notably by John Belinsky many years ago. What we, uh, I think, are beginning 
we are going to have to cope with is how science gets funded in our country. Um, already we've seen a new education policy, the national education policy of 2020, and there is a complete restructuring of the governance of uh, higher education in our country. Uh, most notably, the National Research Foundation or the NRF uh, has been set up very recently. And its very structure seems to suggest that knowledge production will, in a very practical way, be guided by governmental policies. Uh, and it, one has to wait to see how, uh, how it comes through. But even in the structure of the funding, um, I mean, there is an ideological one over here of uh, the funding is going to be essentially three quarters by private industry, uh, one way or the other, uh, and only a quarter by the government. Uh, now, there's a very, very sort of significant tension between uh, the interests of governments, which are to, to try to do uh, as much as it can for its people, and private industry, which would like to presumably support, quote unquote, profitable research. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, the sort of is, is, I think, one of the major tensions of our current time, because we do celebrate science. We do uh, in, in some way or the other, whether it is Chandrayaan, uh, you know, landing on the moon or whatever. We do, we do actually, I, I think as a nation, there is a fundamental belief in whichever way, in, in sort of in a complicated way, we do believe in science. We are, we realize we are a scientific society. But at the same time, we coexist uneasily with, uh, with conflicting approaches to science and to governance. And one of the important themes that Prabir has discussed in his book um, is the way in which science is shaped by the societal needs. Uh, D.D. Kosambi, with whose quotation uh, this book starts, which of course made me already like the book, uh, even without having read more than a page, uh, where Kosambi defines science as the cognition of necessity. Uh, this uh, tellingly, uh, Kosambi's quotation is from a book of his, a uh, collection of essays known as the Exasperating Essays. Uh, Prabir's collection of essays is not exasperating, but they are very thought-provoking. And uh, they, they I, let, let me just say that, you know, if I were to call this, give it an alternative title, I would say inciting essays. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ramaswamy. I'd like to ask Prabir how he'd respond to the alternative title that you've suggested, which is inciting essays. Prabir, can we please have you respond to that i'm going to respond to all three and uh, come to ram last how do you make what you postulate as science more predictive and therefore that the how do you actually take out from nature the degree of uncertainty that exists and i think that's a very interesting thought that i never uh, that had never occurred to me so i think that that within science, therefore, to stick to define the boundaries within which that you formulate your laws is, I think, an interesting uh, thought. And calling them as artifacts, I think that is even more interesting for me. I never thought of it in this sense. Now, it is also true that when we talk about, the, and again, I'm going to pick up only one of his other ideas, that how do you resolve the contradiction between knowledge as commons and knowledge as a part of self-reliance and therefore of nationalism? I would argue that that's a, that is actually uh, not probably the right uh, dichotomy to focus on because if you picture knowledge as commons, then if you don't decide to use it for only profit-making purposes, expand it as national power in the globe, then you can think of it as 
knowledge that is shared amongst countries and therefore allows each to grow and each of them to develop what their interests, skills and needs are. Therefore, they necessarily are not antipodes, they're not opposites. But how do you resolve that tension depends which kind of framing that you adopt, whether you adopt the, good, the, the larger good of humankind or you say the larger good of my kind. And I think that is something that we have to keep in mind that how do you resolve this contradiction? Hopefully, Satyajit uh, can be asked a set of questions and give a set of written answers. Then we can put it into a next book. I'm going to leave Satyajit here and move on to what Fred discussed. And of course, the critical issue that he has raised on how enclosures of knowledge ultimately lead to enclosures which are physical. Who owns the product? who owns the crops, essentially the seeds, who then owns the, uh, the herbicide, and then how instead of promoting a more healthy agriculture, you want to promote more herbicides, you don't want your seeds to be such that they can continue uh, replicating themselves, but you want every year people to buy seeds from your seed company, and so on. So here, of course, is the classical issue public good versus private greed. And that's the central issue that, of course, when you talk about knowledge as commons, you are also talking about who owns knowledge and should it be society as a whole? Should it be individuals? And we know individuals really need individual companies. Ram has raised, of course, a lot of issues. Again, he's also paid me, I think, much more compliments than I deserve. Thank him for that. Education itself becoming a commodity is clearly an issue. But here, much more narrowly focusing on that if research is going to be driven by companies, what happens? Three-fourth private, and as you know, this three-fourth private is notional, but it will be a significant of public investment in different forms will go into it as well, though it will be called one-fourth. The reality is that who drives the agenda and who gets to use the products of that. Now, here is the technical issue, which is can be narrowly focused, which is that earlier there was an attempt in India to reproduce the Baidol Act. At that time, there was enough political support for that science and technology, which is coming out of public domain, uh, universities, public domain institutions should not be privatized. But now that this kind of new education policy is being formulated, where they are going to shell out supposedly the three-fourths of the money and the government one-fourth of the money, then it means giving, putting them in the driver's seat. And that is going to then lead to all the problems that Fred had talked about, which is have taken place, which has taken place in the US universities and also now across the globe. And I think that is an arena of struggle. That means knowledge as commons remains for the university system, for the colleges, for the science institutions, the research lab laboratories, an arena of struggle where we have to see how to expand the commons rather than let it shrink. So with this, I'm going to close my contributions to, to what I had to respond to, though it has not been a full response because that would have taken a lot more time. And of course, I think that a lot of this was very complimentary, but I'm sure that I will hear from at least some of them what they really feel about the book. Thank you very much. Dinuta Leftward for publishing the book and letting it go to the market and uh, to my to our readers.